Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Can we uh, close the door, please, and can everybody try to find a seat? Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, this, you know, normally uh, I try to limit my own moderating role to the Saturday morning sessions, but this afternoon I'm making an exception because we are now talking about an issue that is not only close to the heart of Presidents Vucic and Tachi, and of course has been uh, among the core tasks of Commissioner Han, but it's also been an issue that's been very close to my own heart and to my own professional life. Uh, we're talking about the relationship between Serbia and Kosovo this afternoon, and let me uh, try to just set the stage a little bit uh, with just a couple of preliminary remarks. First, just be before the two of you came in, we said uh, goodbye to uh, the preceding panel, which was the panel of uh, Prime Minister Tsipras and Saev, who are uh, using, uh, for good reasons, this conference to celebrate their own magnificent diplomatic success story. So uh, maybe one of the questions uh, that you might wish to, uh, to talk about is, uh, what is keeping you from celebrating the kind of success story that uh, these two uh, are now enjoying? Why is it so hard? And uh, so that's just one preliminary remark. Second, uh, I do want to sort of just frame the debate a little bit. As far as I'm concerned, I have been confronted with what I would call if I may call it that, Mr. President, the Kosovo problem, which it used to be, uh, 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 as early as 1995, when I was the chief negotiator for the German government in the um, effort to end the conflict in Bosnia, the instructions I got from Chancellor Kohl and his government as I was traveling to Dayton, Ohio, the instructions were pretty clear. They, they included a number of issues, were, of course, pertaining to Bosnia and Herzegovina specifically, but they included the instructions to include the Kosovo issue uh, in a settlement. Now, as history knows, and as uh, all the experts assembled here know, I failed in, uh, uh, in trying to put that problem on the agenda at the time because not only was President Milosevic adamantly opposed to even discussing it because he said it's an internal issue and you have no right to discuss it, but others were also not so sure that it was a smart idea to start talking about Kosovo since we had too much on the plate already with, with difficult uh, Dayton, namely Bosnian issues. So it remained untouched at the time. So that was 95. In 1998, um, during a time when, when actually Austria uh, had the presidency of the European Union, uh, we had a little troika uh, uh, of the European Union at the level of political directors. I found myself traveling to Kosovo with my Austrian colleague, Albert Rohan, and the British colleague. And um, as it happened, our trip ended up in a small place not far from Pristina called Malishevo, a village where shelling had been so heavy that you had to watch your step on the road into the village because it was this high covered with machine gun shells. There was not a living soul in the village. Everybody had left. A, a few of the homes were burning. And the next day, my small delegation, including myself, we were then in Belgrade meeting with representatives of the 
then uh, government. And uh, we said this was a pretty horrible thing and something needed to be done about it. And unfortunately, at that moment, uh, in Belgrade, there was no willingness, no political willingness to admit that horrible things had begun to happen in Kosovo uh, uh, at that time in, uh, during the uh, year of 1998. Fast forward to uh, a year later, 1999, when finally, uh, after the unhappy uh, long, long weeks of uh, military intervention, Resolution 1244 was finally adopted. A big breakthrough because Russia came back into the fold and uh, a long-term solution we thought had been established. And then unfortunately the Atisari operation, so carefully crafted and uh, worked out with intense cooperation from Russia, there were important Russian members in the Atisari team, et cetera, et cetera. The Atisari plan failed to be adopted at the United Nations in the spring of 2007, at which point, as a, as a last resort, the Troika effort was started, of which I was part for, this, for the second half of 2007. And here again, we went an American, a European, that was myself representing the EU, and the Russian, my good friend Alexander Botsan Kachenko from the Russian Foreign Ministry. We worked diligently with uh, the Kosovo delegation, of which you were an important part at that time, and the Serb delegation, which was a very professional delegation, even of, uh, then, of course. And again, we failed. We didn't produce an outcome that appeared to be acceptable to all sides. And then, of course, in uh, February of 2008, Kosovo declared independence. And it is sad for me, having spent a lot of time of my own diplomatic work on this issue, that even today, even though there have been important steps forward, uh, and there is no war going on, uh, but even today, there are key issues remaining unresolved. And that's why, really why we're here. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome the two presidents uh, and, and my good friend Johannes Hahn, who is of course the EU Commissioner for Enlargement Issues. And we want to uh, try to understand why it is so hard to reach agreement. And uh, maybe if I may, I, I start with you, uh, President Vucic, if you could just um, explain to us in a couple of minutes or so, you know, what, uh, what makes it hard from your side? And why are we not celebrating a breakthrough success in uh, 2019, in February of 2019? Please. First of all, thank you for having us here. And uh, we really appreciate the way you're hosting this entire conference, Mr. Ischinger. And uh, I think that the issue of Kosovo, the issue of the relationship between Belgrade and Pristina is much more complicated, much more difficult than the issue between today, North Macedonia and Greece. And uh, when we speak about belgrade pristina relationship, we speak about people, we speak about people's destinies, we speak about uh, territories, we speak about all different issues that are not easy to be tackled. And you have just mentioned one thing that's been very important for all of us, dare to say, and there is no ongoing war, which is very important for all of us. And uh, I think that stability, tranquility, and peace is something that we accomplished. It's not something to be taken as granted. It's something that we accomplished through our dialogue process in the recent years. And that's why I was always very much afraid of the possibility that someone might defreeze 
the so-called frozen conflict. Speaking about dialogue process, it's in a stalemate. And uh, before saying something else, I want to say here before the audience of an entire world that Serbia is doing its best to reach a compromising solution. And we are, re we are really doing so. And here I have all the documents that we have adopted so far, including the Brussels Agreement. And I have to say that Serbia fulfilled all its obligations from Brussels Agreement. And not only that, Serbia didn't do any unilateral acts that might cause the problems to the other side and that might cause any kind of instability. But why we are in a stalemate today? Today is exactly 2,126 days after we adopted Brussels Agreement. And we fulfilled, there are only 15 items. And from 7th to 15th item, there were all obligations of Serbia. And we delivered 100%. It means we participated in local and parliamentary elections under the Kosovo law. Uh, we did, and we delivered on telecom, which means that they got their dial code. It means that we delivered on justice and judiciary issue, regional police, civil protection units. They had only one obligation to deliver on. That was Serb Community Serb Association. Today's 2,126 day. They delivered zero, nothing at all. Even after that, we were begging them not to go, not to try to become a part of different international organizations and institutions. We were saying that should be a part of a dialogue. And you're going to fail. And that will spoil the atmosphere within your own public audience. They didn't want to listen to us, and they failed, trying to be a part of Interpol, UNESCO, and the other international organizations. Then they imposed anti-civilized, I dare to say, tariffs against Serbia. Although they adopted all the rules and all the regulations regarding SEFTA's arrangement in 2006. And uh, now it's exactly 102 days after they imposed those tariffs against Serbia. And uh, regardless of or in spite of international pressure, including Germany's pressure, European Union pressure, American pressure, not to mention Russia and China. <coughs> they didn't deliver on that. They are stubborn, obstinate, and they always say, well, we'll do it after they recognize Kosovo's independence. They, it means Serbia. Then what happened later? Serbia didn't react. Serbia didn't react at all. We didn't impose any reciprocal measures. We didn't do anything against them. But what we are facing with? We are facing with a new platform that was adopted by so-called Kosovo government. And they adopted a platform which is anti-dialogue platform. That document stipulates that uh, Kosovo should protect its territorial integrity, which is inviolable, inalienable, insepar inseparable. And at the same time, Serbia will have to recognize Kosovo's independence. And furthermore, they should form a new tribunal for the Serbs and for Serbia that committed terrible crimes in Kosovo. And then there is my question, because I always hear from some of smarter Albanian politicians from Kosovo that we are close to an arrangement which is not close to the reality. Because, you know, Pristina talks the talk but doesn't walk the talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, what I can say, uh, once again, why we are anyway part of a dialogue? Why someone needs Serbia? Because they decided on everything. They just wait for our signature. They're going to get everything. We're going to lose everything. 
And then what? Do you really think that it's going to happen like that? Of course, it won't happen. And let me remind you on my on first sentences that I pronounced here. Serbia is very dedicated and we acted in a very responsible way, in a very serious way. When we say that we'll provide into deed something, we do it. Which means when we signed that Brussels agreement, I went to North Mitrovica. Had, that was one out of two most difficult days that I've ever had. And I was booed my, by my own people, almost physically attacked by them. But I had enough courage to say to them that peace became the most important issue for the Serbs, because we are not afraid of our economic future. We had a good growth rate, 4.4%. We are cutting our and changing our, the trajectory of our public debt. Unemployment rate, we cut from 26% to 11.3%. Everything goes well. Something that can put everything in jeopardy, it's our relationship with Pristina. And we'll be very keen resuming <coughs> the dialogue process with Pristina, and we'll do our best to reach really a compromising solution. It cannot be, a, and it won't be, a capitulation of one side, in this case, Serbian side, if they are willing full to continue the real dialogue process, we are at disposal not only for European Union, but for the Albanians, for all Serbs and Serbians, because I think the most important issue is how we're going to develop Serb-Albanian relationship. It's not about European Union, it's not about US, it's about us. It's about our future. And that's what I was saying to Mr. Tachi thousands of times. We are very much ready to continue the dialogue. We just wait for them because I heard these kind of promises from their side for tens of times so far that they will revoke their decision on tariffs. So far, it didn't happen. We are ready to carry on. And I am not that optimistic that you were, dear Mr. Ischinger, but if we work hard, if we work in a very diligent and dedicated way, I don't refuse the possibility of reaching a compromising solution. But uh, today, we are unfortunately very far away from that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, a frank description. So let's go straight to President Daci and ask, so what keeps you from uh, you know, taking this one little step, which uh, President Vucic has just described, uh, and uh, everything would be OK? Thank you very much, Mr. Dorn. Ischinger, President Vucic, and Commissioner Hahn. I will continue in Albanian language. Thank you very much. Once more, thank you for this opportunity, Ambassador Schinger, to discuss about the future of the relationship between the state of Kosovo and the state of Serbia. It is the third time for me to be in the panel like this one. And on the three occasions we talked about Kosovo-Serbia relations, I am impressed with the agreement that Tsipras and Zayev have reached, and I believe that not only that we have one less problem in the Western Balkans, but it's a giant step in establishing lasting peace and stability in the Western Balkans. Therefore, I believe that it would be very stimulating for us, and it's our turn, actually, of Kosovo and Serbia to reach an agreement. I'm very uh, much aware that the relationship Kosovo-Serbia is much more complicated and much more difficult one than the one, the relationship or the discussion that Greece and Macedonia had. 
We have a very old problem between Kosovo and Serbia, and of course, uh, 100 years of uh, animosity and hostilities. And as you all remember, with a very fresh period of the war of Kosovo in 1998-99. Today, I was more planning to focus on the future of the relations between Kosovo and Serbia, Pristina and Belgrade. But let me also add some uh, points about Brussels as well. In 2013, we reached the first agreement between Kosovo and Serbia in Brussels, and I still believe this was a huge success. Most of these agreements have been implemented or are being implemented, but implementation of agreements can only be when they are in line with the uh, Constitution and the laws of a country. Therefore, the messages that you just heard here are only slightly true. Also, what I would like to focus on immediately is where are we now? Where do we stand now? We are, we are in a situation of a conflict, a frozen conflict of a status quo that I believe that for Kosovo represents a regression, and it is vital that we move forward in finding a creative solution that would mean stamping one and for all uh, the peace between Kosovo and Serbia, an agreement that will entail mutual recognition and, of course, Kosovo's membership in the Security Council uh, in the Un United Nations. President Vucic mentioned other points about Kosovo as well. Also in the Brussels agreement, it was very clear that we should not be an obstacle for Kosovo, that nobody should be an obstacle for Kosovo membership in international organization. You all re remember what happened in UNESCO or Interpol, and this has caused the reaction of Kosovo with the tariffs that I continue to, to believe that the sooner it is suspended, it will give a chance to our to dialogue between our countries, our people, and also will not uh, give anybody any uh, justification to condition the dialogue. The dialogue should continue without any conditions. We've had more than 100 reasons to to put conditions to uh, the dialogue, but we never did. We were always very generous to work, to work, to getting closer, and to reach an agreement, final agreement. Of course, there are challenges between us, but what is very important, the Serbian community should not be used only for political uh, gains by the Serbian state. We will work hard, and I wish that we see flexibility, creativity also in Belgrade, and that in weeks and months to come, we find a final agreement that will preserve multi-ethnic character of Kosovo and of Serbia, that will conclude once and for all hostilities between Kosovo and Serbia, and not between Albanians and Serbs. But of course, this would have reflection in all the countries where Albanians live, but also Montenegrans, uh, Macedonians, and others. This agreement would help p peace and stability in the region. But also, let me add something as well. It has become almost like uh, fashionable to mention the special court in every forum. I, let me say that Kosovo has taken all its responsibilities for this issue together with uh, United States and the EU, but everybody today asks who has been convicted for 13,000 civilian Albanians killed in Albania by the Serb forces, who has been convicted f for 400 massacres committed by the Serbian state in Kosovo, or more than 20,000 victims of uh, sexual violence by the state apparatus. This has not been done by Serbia. This has not been by the international community. Milosevic was in that, but we know how that finished. Nobody else was uh, punished for th th But let's focus towards the future. 
Otherwise, the victim, Kosovo is the biggest victim, the people of Kosovo who have suffered ethnic cleansing to the extreme. Thank you. This is supposed to be I hope that it won't be. I hope and thank you for allowing me to allowing me to react on this what Mr. Tachi was saying. First of all, at the beginning of his introduction, he said that many things were fulfilled, but there is only one that hasn't been fulfilled. That's the formation of Serb community or Serb association, which was their only one obligation. And you know what was his comment? It cannot be something that is formed against the constitution yeah. of the Kosovo country. Uh -huh. It means that if something's against the constitution of Serbia and almost everything is not always directly in accordance with our constitution, we should stop discussing. Or we should say there is no venue, there is no space for any further conversations, any further dialogue. We don't care about their constitution because we don't recognize their state. In a way, they don't care about our constitution, which says that Kosovo and Metohija are part of Serbia. And that's why we have this kind of dialogue. And that's something that they don't understand. On the other hand, Mr. Tachi was saying, now you're going to see all of you. Doesn't matter which side you support or you just want to see a final solution. He said that there is an obligation of Serbia not to stop them being a part of different international organizations and institutions. We have just said that. Where is that written? Please. Here is the Brussels Agreement. Available for all of you. Nowhere. There is something else. It was written in a draft proposal. I didn't accept it. And that did not become a part of Brussels Agreement. It's not written here. Please find it. Give it to Hashim just to find it. <laughs> and you're not going to find it. It's in English. Don't worry, it's not in Serbian. It's in English, and you're not going to find it. And I'm not going to make any comments about exaggerated figures, but I'll tell you one thing, because you were taking care of the situation, Ms. Rischinger, in Kosovo. And you were speaking about different world order after 1999, because the international community wanted to avert humanitarian catastrophe, and that's why you helped Kosovo Albanians. But there is one data which I would like to stress, which I would like to emphasize today here. You were speaking about 850,000 refugees, people that were forced to leave Kosovo, mainly to Albania. Today, even though I think it was not only exaggerated, but let me stop with this. But all these, doesn't matter whether it was 150,000 or 850,000, they are all back. But you know what happened with 150,000 Serbs that left Kosovo after 1999? Nothing. That's the smallest percentage of returnees in an entire world, which means officially 1.3% of Serbs came back to their thresholds to their homes. And when you speak about 1990s and atrocities done by one guy, I can speak for weeks about terrible atrocities committed against Serbian people. But here, and now I'm stopping here, I just showed you, because I'm very responsible and very serious man, just showed you an example how they use something that became, you know, accepted by all international players, by all international stakeholders. Like, you know, you Serbs are doing your best to revoke recognition of Kosovo in many countries. Yes, we do. But they do everything 
to get recognized by all the other countries. And Madagascar is by far the best example. They attacked us and they said, you see those bloody Serbs, those crazy guys, they were working very hard to revoke recognition of Kosovo and they went to Madagascar, to Antananarive. They, yes, we did it. But you know what happened a year before that? During our dialogue process, they got recognition from Madagascar. When they were doing that, it was a proper way of delivering good results for the dialogue framework. When we did the same, it was a bloody terrible move by those stupid Serbs, and that's it. What I'm speaking here about, it's double standard approach. You cannot say to me today, dear Mr. Ischinger, and you know, doesn't matter that we disagree on many things. You know how much I appreciate you personally and respect you, and you know that we are very responsible, very serious, and very dedicated to this job. Because I can tell you something. We want to preserve this kind of economic growth. We want to see a bigger and a better pace for Serbia's future. And we want to resolve our problems with Albanians once for all. And we really want to do so. And I know that. Tachi knows that. But we need to have a reliable partner. We need viable solutions. We need someone who will not play the role for international community only. We need to do it between ourselves and for ourselves. And to tell you the truth, I don't care what would be the reaction of that international partner or another international partner. It's about us. It's between us. If we'll be able to create that axis of peace between Serbs and Albanians, two biggest nations of the Western Balkans, that'll mean peace for next 100, 200 years. That's why we are ready to invest all our efforts. That's why I'm personally very ready to risk not only my political career, but much more than that. And Johannes knows that. Much more than that. Just to try to reach a possible agreement, but it has to be a compromising arrangement. It cannot be that one side gets everything, the other side loses everything. We have to be both dissatisfied with that, with that solution. That would be a win-win situation. Sorry that I showed a bit of, not mine, but Serbia's frustration over this dialogue process. Mm. And when someone says someone is putting conditions, we're not putting conditions. We fulfilled everything from that Brussels agreement. They didn't do only one thing they had to do. And after that, they imposed tariffs against us. And we are losing 45 million euros per month. And we are still calm doing nothing against them. There are no reciprocal measures against them. You really think that we cannot harm them? And their explanation for their public audience and for the entire world is, we wanted to harm Serbia. OK, congratulations. You did it. And we don't want to do that with them. We don't want to do that with anyone else. Because we are orient future oriented, looking towards the future. And I'm ready, and Tachi knows that. I'm ready always to speak to them, always. And they didn't hear a single bad word about Albanian people from myself. Never, ever. Because we appreciate them. We respect them. We appreciate their interests. But we have our own interests as well. And someone should care about it also. Sorry that it took a lot of your time. No, 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 that's fine. And uh, I, you know, th I want to thank you because it's important for, certainly for this audience and beyond, to, of course, to understand that this is not a little chicken game that, uh, that you are playing here, but this is uh, about very fundamental interests and, uh, and, and about domestic issues and politics. Uh, no doubt this is very difficult. We wouldn't be sitting here if it were easy. And uh, before handing over to Johannes Hahn to uh, t take a look at it from the European Commission point of view, let me just say, and I'm not, you know, it's not my job to criticize either one of you. All I'm saying is, as a German, there is no such thing as categorical impossibility of resolving a political conflict. We learned this 
fortunately, you know, some uh, 25 years ago, uh, 28 years ago, when uh, out of the blue, something happened to our nation, which everybody had thought would never happen in our lifetime, the unification of Germany. So I, I have become a believer through that process uh, 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 in, 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 in the theory that in foreign policy, in international relations, in international conflict, the, you have a conflict, you have an unresolved issue between the two of you. Resolving that conflict is not impossible, but it takes political will, it takes the correct timing, it takes the ability to compromise, it, it also requires a level of trust. There are a number of conditionalities which I can imagine play a bigger or a smaller role. So, but fundamentally, I would not take it from either one of you that it can be done. It can be done and hopefully it will be done. And before you respond, uh, Johannes, why don't you uh, uh, take, a, take a careful look from the European Union Commission? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you were referring, uh, Wolfgang, that uh, just before um, uh, Greece and North Macedonia were in a way celebrating their rightly so, their agreement. I'm not quite sure if it is less complicated than the resolution of uh, uh, this uh, issue. Um, but at least there is one element I want to, to, to uh, refer. And this is when the two leaders and their teams, I'm now referring to North Macedonia and Greece, started to negotiate this. This was only purely supported by their respective uh, citizens. So I think uh, in, in North Macedonia, less than 20%, and most likely in Greece, a similar number was uh, supportive uh, for finding an agreement. And nevertheless, finally, they managed uh, to, to, to strike an agreement. And uh, I mean, in the meantime, I think the approval rate to this has, uh, I wouldn't say skyrocketed, but uh, it has really improved within a couple of weeks. And this should uh, give us some optimism and also encourage all of us uh, to find a solution. And um, I think it was rightly said by the two presidents, not only today, but several times, but also to others, everything what you are doing, what you're aiming at, is not to serve us, some European officials. It's in the interest of your citizens. And uh, Melinda Brego just uh, uh, gave me recent figures of uh, uh, opinion poll in the region, uh, saying that 75% um, of people in the region and from the region are in favor of regional cooperation, of cross-border cooperation, acknowledging how important uh, this is for welfare. And so to say, the most pressing issue for people in the region is the economic situation, is the situation of unemployment. Particularly in Kosovo, 75% of people are, so to say, um, afraid about the unemployment situation. So what we have uh, launched uh, almost two years ago is, for instance, a regional economic area, which uh, includes all the six countries of the region, uh, in order to abandon formal, informal barriers, uh, trying to improve uh, trade and everything which is related to it. In order to stimulate the economic development, to address the brain drain, to address uh, the huge unemployment rate, in particular of young people. And I have to say, the, the positive outcome of this dialogue is Crucial is the core issue of the whole uh, West Balkan uh, European perspective. And not only the European perspective, but simply the improvement of living conditions. Because if we are working on regional cooperation, but the two are blocking each other, they are blocking the four others. And therefore, it has an impact on the situation of all of them, and finally, on the stability of the region. And this is exactly what we are aiming at, to export stability in order to import instability. But mainly, and this is the reason for asking for the floor, it's about the interests of the people on the ground. 
And that's why I, uh, I mean, I have um, participated in different um, panels together with the two and also others on this subject. There were sometimes moments where it was more optimistic than maybe today, but I'm nevertheless grateful for the um, um, continuing uh, commitment to work on the solution. And the second thing is, I think it's not only high time, it's, it's more than that. And um, it's now, even it doesn't sound and look like a window of opportunity to strike very soon a deal, and I hope this is not any kind of indication, um, to strike very soon because energy uh, um, changes and switches are part of our discussions. Um, but we should try to strike a deal as soon as possible, may I say, till the end of the mandate of the current commission. Because then there is a new, a new crew. You never know who and how and so until everybody is familiar with it. And if we are losing time, we are losing momentum, and we are losing, so to say, support by your citizens, but also by member states. And therefore, I only urge you to work on a constructive solution. As President Vucic rightly said, it's about a compromise. And the compromise is always something where both parts have to give in in order to have finally more. And this is something everybody has to understand. And I, I really rely on your commitment. Uh, but it's not only about your commitment. It's also about uh, some um, colleagues, may I say, in the countries uh, to support all these efforts. I think, thank you, uh, Johannes. I think we would be making a, a mistake in this discussion, which uh, we don't have much more time to, to have, if we didn't raise two questions. And I'm, I'm just going to try to throw out these two questions to both of you. First, um, if these problems are so tough as you described, and you, you, you got really emotional about it, and which I understand. Um, what might be your expectations and your expectations? Uh, do we have different expectations as far uh, as, far as uh, we, the EU, or, uh, or other actors? Uh, could we do something different? Do you need uh, a different kind of mediation or help or support or patronage? Uh, what can we do to make it easier? That's the first question. Is there anything that we can do to make it easier? Second question is, and I, I think this is sort of the, the elephant in, in the room, um, the international media have been you know, uh, pitched very highly uh, over these last uh, months over and over again. Uh, with this um, idea of uh, border changes and land swap and to what extent uh, that would be desirable or terrible or both. Uh, so if you could please also refer to this question and either tell us if that's important for the solution or no longer a big issue. President Vucic, would, or do you want to start? Uh, please. Today I was really focused uh, on the opportunities or possibilities for the agreement and discuss about the future. But let me still tr clarify two things before I go back to the possibilities for the, um, the agreement. Yesterday I read that uh, President Vucci said that he will defend Serbia strongly here today in the panel, but I don't know what he has to defend today here. It's easy to make to create drama or to play a victim. But we cannot rewrite the history. The whole world knows the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo was conducted by state of Serbia, Serb police and Serb military, but also another reality. Since June 99, we had NATO, K4, UN, OSC in, in Kosovo and part of the, of the, uh, the Serbs, part of the Serbs who left, left with the columns of soldiers and police that left uh, Kosovo. The association of the Kosovo Serb communities, yes, we agreed to establish uh, this association of municipalities with majority Serb 
community, but we agree that it has to be in line with Kosovo Constitution, Kosovo laws, and meeting all the standards for local governance. The misunderstanding is that Mr. Vucic still understands, still doesn't understand that I'm a, the president of a sovereign country. Kosovo is a sovereign country recognized by 116 different countries. I think that if it was easy to reach an agreement, others before us would have reached an agreement. It would, it would not fall on us to work for an agreement. But I still believe, I still hope, that even though it will be almost impossible to reach an agreement, because the hostilities are very big, very deep, but still I continue to hope. And why do I hope? Because there is willingness to sit down and discuss. At least Mr. Vucic and I, we sit down and discuss. Those who are opposed, those who are opposed to dialogue and peace even propose building a, a wall between uh, Serbs and Albanians. We do have differences in our opinions, but at least we do talk to each other. We have expressed our willingness and wish to sit down to discuss and re really to reach not a temporary but a permanent agreement that will bring recognition of Kosovo and membership of Kosovo in the United Nations. But I also know that this will not be a present. The recognition of Kosovo will not be a present from Belgrade to Kosovo. I know that it has to be a compromise, a compromise that we have to discuss jointly, authorities of Pristina and authorities of Belgrade, with the leading role of the European Union. And why can we reach an agreement now? Because its European Union is leading, and I invite all member states to be as much unique as they can in the support for the process. The United States are very clear, and they have clarified this in the letters that President Trump has said to Mr. Vucic and to me, again, two days ago. But what is new is that in Rabi, we didn't discuss about agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, or in Vienna. But now we are discussing Kosovo and Serbia and uh, expressing readiness to come to an agreement. Also, what is uh, new and hopeful, though there are no guarantees, that is that even Russia might accept an agreement reached between Kosovo and Serbia. This would mean global recognition of the agreement, and it would finally give a stamp, put a stamp on peace and stability in the Western Balkans. Therefore, unity of EU and US, I'm very convinced, will help us a great deal to reach an agreement between Kosovo and Serbia. We will build peace, though we will uh, have differences. But Kosovo and Serbia can be a model like German Frank model of after Second World War. I know there is a lot of skepticism. There are those who are criticizing. But I don't hear any alternatives, any ideas how to move forward, how to overcome this status quo, this, this uh, frozen conflict. I hear talking about Pandora's book. But in reality, in the Balkans, Pandora's book has already been opened. And it's exactly this agreement between Kosovo and Serbia that will help to close the Pandora's box. Leaders of the region, Montenegro, Albania, Macedonia, support our efforts. There are others who are only presenting ideas who really don't stand ground, who don't reflect the realities of the developments in the Western Balkans. We can maintain this frozen relationship but this will reflect negatively in the whole Western Balkans. And, and as long as we don't reach an agreement as Kosovo and Serbia, there would be even more influence in the Western Balkans by non-Western or anti-Western ideologies in the Western Balkans. Less in Kosovo, since we are the most pro-European and pro-American country in the Western Balkans, even though we are the most isolated one. But we don't have any alternative. We will not spare, save, to reach an agreement with Serbia this year, even though we are still very far and we have great uh, differences. But a balanced agreement that will not bring joy to another one and misery to another one, but will uh, move, move us beyond uh, the animosities and to loss in friendship.
won't refer too much to Mr. Tachi's words on our past, not because I have nothing to say about it, but because I really think that your questions were, and our responses to your questions are more important. But let me say one thing about it. They are doing something that we were doing after the Second World War, self-victimizing themselves everywhere. Whenever you say something about non-fulfillment of their obligations, they always call for some remembrance of the days from the past. And if you say something that they don't like to hear, it's always rewriting of history. Okay, if that's easier for you, it's okay. But I have a very single and a very simple question on which you have no response, Mr. Tachi, and none of you. And that is, if I don't accept that you're a leader of a sovereign state, and I don't accept that before we reach, maybe one day, who knows, or some other guys will reach it, that agreement. My question is, why do, why do you need me? Why do you need us? Why do you negotiate with Serbia? If everything's finished, if everything's done, why do you need us? How did it happen that you are still not a UN member state? How is it happening that you are not a member of Interpol? How is it happening that you are not a member of UNESCO? Because you are consolidated sovereign state according to your words. It means that you need to negotiate, and we need to negotiate, not because we are not a consolidated state, we are, but we need to keep the peace, we need to maintain tranquility. That's why we, we need to talk to you. And it's very honest, very sincere, maybe selfish, but that's the real reason. And you have your own reasons. We don't expect nothing from EU. They're good hosts, we do all the negotiations under the auspices of EU. We have no bad words about Mogherini, about the other people, like we hear from Pristina, because there is always fault on the other side. It's never their fault. One day it's Serbia's fault, another day it's European Union fault, the third day it's Russia's fault, the fourth day it's I don't know which fault, but it's never their fault. I think that the persons to be blamed, it's Mr. Tachi and myself and no one else, because it's about us. It's about us creating an atmosphere, creating an environment. And there are a lot of people here that can confirm these are my words. We are doing our best to lower to lowering the expectations of our public audience. They are doing their best to expanding the expectations of their own public audience. And that's what creates bad atmosphere for the future. And on the other hand, speaking about land swap, we hate this kind of term, because it would mean that two sovereign states are changing something. But that's why we are using demarcation. And from the very simple reason. When I ask you, Dear friend, Mr. Rischinger, which borders we are talking about? Borders that are recognized by Germany or by China? By US or by Russia? By Spain or by Italy? By Greece or by Turkey? By Belgrade or by Pristina? Totally different borders. Totally different borders. That's why we need to negotiate. That's why we need to negotiate absolutely everything, every single issue. That's why we need to be as much open as it is possible to hear the other side. And I'm always ready. There was no single topic that we launched that I didn't listen to Pristina's delegation. There was no real topic that we didn't want to listen to their remarks, to their requests, to their demands. And that's what we ask for ourselves, nothing more than that. And you see today, because it's an open session. We discussed all our issues in a way that it is. It shows all the difficulties, and it's better to be seen how difficult that is and how difficult that might be in the future than to, you know, do that sort of charade for the international public audience. Now we are going to get a Nobel Prize. Hey, come on. It's 
ridiculous. What we need is a dedicated, very hard work with one, two, or three percent of chances trying to reach a possible compromise. I can guarantee from Serbian side, from Belgrade side, that we'll, that we'll do our best. And I cannot guarantee that we'll be successful. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm, I'm afraid we've really run out of time. We're already five minutes into, five minutes into overtime. So we need to conclude this session. But let me first and foremost say the following. We, um, as the organizers of the Munich Security Conference, we have made a number of efforts to put on stage together leaders who have a problem. And uh, I'm, not now, I'm not now going to name names. I'm a diplomat. But I can tell you that these two are the only ones who agreed to do it uh, without being able to celebrate today and to say, we did it. But you were gracious enough, and uh, if I may say so, courageous enough to come to this stage to explain what's not working and, uh, and, and to some extent why. Uh, but I think I also appreciate the fact that you both repeated your commitment to continuing this process. And, uh, and just to repeat, of course, I'm, I can't speak on behalf of uh, any government. Uh, Johannes can speak on behalf of the European Union. I think all of us, our governments, our institutions, are willing to provide assistance, support, help, if anything can be done to advance the process. So I really want to thank you. Uh, and I have one little wish. Now that we've uh, decided to celebrate uh, today in this previous discussion and tonight at the dinner with the Kleist Award Ceremony, um, uh, you know, North Macedonia and Greece, wouldn't it be great if next year you two guys could get this award? Try to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.